Hey everybody, uh, sorry I'm a couple minutes late uh, with Embrace the Shake tonight. I haven't had a little bit of some medical issues today, but I think I got it together for tonight. So as I mentioned uh, earlier today, I would be talking about two, uh, two subjects tonight. And the first one would be the five stages or the stages of Parkinson's. Um, the reason I'm bringing that up is... Uh, one of our folks uh, that watches the program um, uh, requested that I do so because they've never really had anybody sit down and explain the stages of Parkinson's and how these, these stages of Parkinson's are tested. And um, with the, with the uh, large amount of research that is provided by the different Parkinson's disease associations and movement disorders associations, uh, I thought I'd go ahead and jump on that and, um, and, and help out and provide some more information. I'd like to thank uh, all of my folks from uh, uh, Shelby High School, uh, uh, Sandra Carter and Vicki Murray. Good to see you all uh, coming on tonight. I appreciate you supporting me. I uh, saw Becky Wright come on. Uh, I missed a couple others, but with the new change of format. Um, hey, Daryl, good to see you. Apologize if I missed your name there. Um, I'll just I'll try to call through, uh, or call through. I'll try to uh, come through and try to recognize everybody. Yeah, it's good to see you. It really is. Um, always, you know, <clears throat> I'm gonna say this about Shelby High School, um, and um, I miss Shelby High School um, every day of the week. And I know I don't visit that much uh, as far as the campus when it was open. But, um, you know, I made a promise to myself that when I stepped away, I would step away and, and, um, and um, uh, visit on occasion. Because uh, I, I don't mind telling you, when you go back in those hallways and see your kids and the smells of the school and um, the people you see and love and miss, it's uh, kind of hard to walk back out of there again. Uh, but I love Shelby High School. There's, there's no greater honor than to be a Golden Lion. I know uh, Coach Bryson's on tonight from Crest, and I know he would attest to the same. There's nothing like being a Crest Charger. We're, we're fortunate to, hey Bob, my college roommate's on tonight. We're so fortunate to have, uh, you know, four really great high schools. Uh, in Cleveland County. Um, there you go, Alex is on tonight. Um, Alex, everybody knows Alex. And um, she is a legend um, at Shelby High School. And, um, you know, there's, there's not many folks on campus as far as teachers um, that, that don't know Alex, and Alex is well known throughout the county as well. Hey, Robin Taylor, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Um, Kathy Brown Brandon uh, from, from Gaffney, good to see you. So uh, let, me, uh, let me get rolling here. Uh, of course, I recognize my sponsors, White Beard Canine, uh, Broad River Hemp Company, Rescue 22, uh, D. Hout and her organization, uh, Pause Your Paws, and Magic City Canine out of Miami, Florida. Uh, Dwayne Fowler, good to see you, Sergeant Fowler, and Petty Officer Fowler. Uh, Dwayne and I were in the Guard together. He also is a served in the United States Marine Corps, uh, excuse me, United States Navy, did serve in the Marine Corps, did, and at the same time was uh, uh, a CB. And uh, for folks, uh, my sister Karen's on tonight, good to see you, Karen. My father was a uh, honorary CB, Navy CB, and was given that distinction. And um, a belt buckle uh, during his uh, tours in Vietnam by the Navy Seals. Alrighty, so let's talk about the stages of Parkinson's disease. Um, as as most folks that have Parkinson's in the United States um, um, are graded by the U.S. scale, which uses five different levels or stages to determine your level of excuse me, uh, disability or less, uh, level of progression 
um, in Parkinson's. There's also a Canadian scale, which is starting to um, <clears throat> gain popularity, if you want to call it that. And that has seven uh, levels or stages of, of, of assessment and progression. And at the same time, and I'm going directly from my notes, uh, the Canadians uh, not only use the Montreal scale that we also use in the United States that we got from them, but they use a, a Canadian non-movement, non-motor uh, questionnaire, which has 30 questions, which uh, assesses the non-motor effects that somebody that has signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease uh, reports themselves. It's what they call a patient reported outcome measure, a PROM. And the person sits down prior to their visit and uh, while they're waiting in the waiting room or wherever and they fill this questionnaire out it's more or less a, a yes or no or rate the scale one to five it's really in depth and it provides another adjunct uh, to the tradition, traditional uh, motor assessment uh, additionally there's a quality of life rating scale um, that the Canadians use it's uh, called the Parkinson Impact Scale. And what it does is it measures what, how you feel your quality of life is and how Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's symptoms, uh, Parkinsonisms, have affected your life. Uh, good to see you, Troop. Thanks for coming on tonight. Uh, Renee Lamb from Livestone. Good to see you the other day, Renee. Uh, uh, work magnificent as always and really appreciate what you do for everybody in the, at Limestone College. Um, the good thing about uh, the different rating scales related to Parkinson's disease and movement disorders, it provides additional tools of measurement so the um, physician or a physician's assistant or movement specialist, which is also a physician assist, a physician rather, um, can make a more accurate uh, measure uh, regarding the type of movement disorder you have, uh, what level of Parkinson's disease you have. Thank you, Maureen. Appreciate the compliment. Good to see you, Brother Don. Um, <clears throat> therefore, as they hone down more on the signs and symptoms, they also hone down on the effect of your life, and these measures also... Um, the non-seen um, signs and symptoms of, of um, um, Parkinson's disease like loss of smell, loss of taste, dry eyes, runny nose, drooling while eating, swallowing difficulties, those kind of things are measured in the uh, non-motor movement uh, questionnaire that I mentioned earlier. Now they're giving you, I gave you a background on the different types of tests uh, from the Canadian background and from the United States assessment. Um, the physicians that I'm involved with, um, which are, I'm very lucky to have them. Teresa Heppelfinger, good to see you tonight. Kristen as well, thanks for being on board. Um, they, they have used these tools uh, for assessment at different times and at different levels. Uh, when I went to Duke University to their um, Parkinson's uh, uh, Disease Center of Excellence, it was a comprehensive um, evaluation, much like I got in Shelby, but it was more in depth because they were really trying to zero in on the movement disorder. Was it a Parkinsonism? Or was it Parkinsonian-like or was it uh, PD? And then um, the final thing is going to be the, the, the DAT scan um, to, to confirm exactly what's going on. And as I told you that, that my diagnosis has shifted from typical idiopathic um, Parkinson's disease, uh, also no partial, uh, Parkinson's affiliated gait disorder, uh, to a multi-component movement disorder. So um, that's where I am. And, 
Um, I was a, graded out as a level three um, when I uh, was under the Parkinson scale. Most of the folks that I box with are level threes, uh, and some are progressing into four. Uh, thank you so much, Charlie. Appreciate what you do. Whitney Holcomb, good to see you. I hope the babies are doing well. Just absolutely beautiful babies. And I hope you're doing well with your career as well. Uh, so I want to talk about stage one. Uh, and usually people that have stage one Parkinson's disease usually don't visit a physician. Uh, they kind of deal with it themselves. And this is where they notice that they have a little bit of a tremor and sometimes have some issues with trying to get around. I'm not saying that they shuffle or they have a drop foot issue, uh, which is really not a true drop foot from perineal nerve injury, but where the foot doesn't pick up and the heel drops, excuse me, where they may have a little bit of a steppage gait where they pick their feet up. I really apologize for this. You're seeing some nice night that I've been dealing with all day. Um, where they pick their feet up a little bit higher to get to get themselves moving forward. They don't have freezing episodes or anything like that. And also they see that these symptoms and signs um, um, are usually on just one side or they're called hemispherical. So one side right or one side left. Usually 99.9% .9 of the time like crest, crest toothpaste. Hey Ashley Green, thanks for being on tonight. Um, and Molly as well, they don't, they're not bilateral or transverse. Um, usually the individual with stage one don't have, don't have any problems at all with conducting their activities of daily living. And I shouldn't have said don't, but uh, they do not usually have issues with their activities of daily living. Uh, they may have some issues with the face, particularly around the auricularis here, labia. Um, and that's usually with the smile or frown um, uh, part of, of the or, oral cavity. <clears throat> One of the hidden signs that you don't see a lot when you're looking at yourself in the mirror is a lip shift. Usually the lower lip, as you can see here, all right, if I put my finger here, you see how this lip, I'm not pushing, I'm just laying my finger off. You notice how this lower lip is angled. Now let's go to the other side. Do you see the difference? That's a hidden sign, and you notice that one part of that lip is raised. This is my right side. And as you see, later on as my disease uh, progressed, whatever it's going to be labeled, of, labeled as, there was a problem with the palate, the lower palate becoming weak and my teeth shifted. Here we go. Now, those symptoms are usually the precursors to Parkinson's disease that were often not ignored. Hello, Akasha. Thanks for coming on tonight. Great lacrosse coach at Limestone. And um, um, I, I think, I, I believe you're in West Virginia now. I may be wrong, uh, but uh, coaching lacrosse there as well. I'm happy for you. We miss you at the Rock. Good to see Patrick. Uh, so those symptoms are the, the non-motor, the hidden, um, and this is, you know, facial affect in here. Uh, I, another thing you may see around the oral cavity when some facial tone changes is the, where the upper lip becomes very, uh, not flaccid, but does not move um, uniformly with the opposing lip in the speech movement. For example, as the bottom lip moves down, 
the lip will trail and go the opposite. And certain words are formed together, and certain words are formed apart, and certain words are formed with protrusion of the lips, and some are formed with retraction. Usually with stage one where there's facial affective change, it's right in here in the lips, and this lip becomes almost flat, Sometimes, not all the time, but it's something to look for, okay? And it doesn't move in opposition or uniform with the lower lip, okay? So that's the major thing, and it's a hidden sign that often we don't pay attention to, and we just kind of say, well, okay, that's just part of getting older. Number two, uh, stage two is when the tremors increase if you have a tremor only 40 percent of the folks if not less have tremors okay a resting or an active tremor or an internal but this is where rigidity starts to show up and some bradykinesia bradykinesia is is a, a slowness of movement and rigidity is um, um, aaron ellis incredible athletic trainer uh, we truly miss you at Limestone, brother. Hope you're enjoying your new, uh, your new uh, uh, location and career as well. The rigidity is the inability for, to, for the joint to extend okay, fluidly without breaking. Okay, not breaking as in break, but moving in, in what they call hitches. That's breaking, joint breaking, or the inability for the hands to close or the arms to stand out, stick out, uh, and fully extend or, or flex fully. So this is rigidity. Now this doesn't go with just Parkinson's. This goes with other movement disorders as well. That's why it can be mistaken for something else, okay? like just dystonia, okay, uh, which is dysfunctional muscle tone. Tonia meaning tone, and dys meaning dysfunctional. Walking and other movement disorders, uh, movement parts start affecting both sides, so now you got shuffling gait starting to show up a little bit, maybe a little bit short stride in your foot movement, okay, almost like a toe walking or an altered gait. And a forward leaning to maintain balance. It's really kind of neat. If the steps are a little bit shorter, then the body leans in a method to keep balance. Or if the body leans, okay, the feet will change, the steppage gait will change to maintain balance. Another thing is watching our arms as far as an arm swing starting to diminish or an arm swing becoming wider where the foot stance is becoming wider ataxic. Um, those are some of the things that go along with stage two. Stage three, usually there's a slow progression between stage two and three, but between two and three is when people start coming to the doctors and, and the neurologist and, and get seen. Uh, usually they're seen stage two with their uh, uh, primary care physician then they're referred. Uh, a lot of people are stubborn, stubborn and hard-headed, uh, like myself, and waited a little bit of, uh, too long uh, into the process, but because of good medical care, it's good to go. This is called the mid-stage, stage three. And um, sometimes you have a loss of balance, but the slowness of movement uh, becomes the hallmark, okay? Another thing is the loss of balance uh, becomes hallmark. Uh, good to see you, Julie and Cindy. Thanks for coming on tonight. Um, and what I mean by the hallmarks is that these become the central core of what is going on. And at the same time, these are the central areas where you see a diminishment of ability. And um, this is the time where a lot of folks with Parkinson's uh, disease say, Oh, this is where I'm going to start going downhill. 
and I'm not going to be pretty about it. They're right. Okay. Uh, most folks that have Parkinson's disease don't get stuck in stage three and stayed at stage three and live at stage three for 20 or 30 years. They're going to become a stage three plus uh, where the activities are daily living, need assistance, and the symptoms of, of uh, bradykinesias, uh, increase of falls, and uh, rigidity are going to um, uh, become very difficult. For example, a person that has stage three in, in the mid stage, okay, and is in early entry stage three, usually doesn't have hardly any problems getting dressed. Where their problems are little buttons and belt loops and stuff. A person that's in the later stage of stage three, same activity of daily living, um, has trouble me, tucking the shirt in, has a hard time working the zipper, has a difficult time getting the belt through all of the loops because the shoulder range of motion is diminishing. They have a hard time maintaining their balance while they're doing this. And at the same time, they have problems fastening the belt or putting their medical alert badge on or putting on a bracelet if they wear one like I wear, one in honor of Tim. And then uh, watches that have holes in them. Now, as my movement disorders progress, um, I'm going to have to change my watch band, okay? And I already have the, the medical alert that I need for later on. Um, and this will never come off, okay? But anyway, stage four, um, this is where you start becoming severely limited in all aspects of movement, okay? In these aspects of movement where you see the greatest part of, uh, of limitation is foot freezing, legs freezing, postural freezing. And um, that's right, Alex. Sometimes uh, not all the therapies and doctors don't always um, get the diagnosis or future predictions of any diagnosis. That's right. Thanks for adding that. Uh, good to see you, Coach Carpenter. Great swim coach. Good friend. Um, great Christian man. Uh, and the final thing I want to say about stage four is that um, early stage fours and on is when the person that has that level of, of disability they really need to have an in an in-house caregiver or have the availability of a family member that can get there um, rather quickly, but you know, be there for assistance um, to get you places. Um, driving usually fades out at stage three, five plus and four. Um, getting dressed, help you with your, your dental activities, um, bathing if needed. Um, and also, um, if, if the person lives alone and has a stage four uh, Parkinson's disease or any stage four uh, movement disorder, a lot of times this is when the physicians will prescribe home health to come in. And then when that happens, um, a, a physical therapist will come, a speech therapist will come, an occupational therapist will come, and they will do a home safety assessment. They will observe you moving through the home. They'll look at your bathroom facilities to make sure that you have the appropriate adaptations or suggest adaptations. Um, excuse me. They may, of course, hopefully we'll have a family member or two with you when they come, the OTPT and speech folks, uh, to take a look at the layout of your house to help move some furniture around, uh, make suggestions of furniture that needs to be eliminated, uh, some modifications to the home itself. So it's really, it's a, it's a great thing that we have the folks uh, skilled um, with that. Uh, great question, Teresa. I was, was going to address that here in a minute. Uh, and Teresa, I have some great facts uh, 
research on how uh, Parkinson's affects men and women differently, and one of them is uh, cognition, uh, and how estrogen um, really helps women with uh, fighting um, Parkinson's disease. So I want to get to the cognitive here in just a second. Um, as usual, we spent so much time together over the years, you definitely can read my mind. Um, in stage four, uh, this is where you see uh, really in stage three, there's some cognitive delay that starts uh, to develop, and that is delay. Uh, you also see some uh, changes in the organizational skills, um, getting your ducks in a row uh, to do your activities of daily le uh, living. Uh, at the same time doing your skills uh, at work. In stage three, um, often this is where people determine that they cannot work and physicians determine they cannot work and you want to use the percentage skill. You're 60% disabled at this point. Uh, therefore, you have absolutely no business working uh, because it is a safety issue. And like a dummy, um, you know, I left Shelby High School because of my Parkinson's at that time. And um, I said, well, you know, I got to keep my cognitive going and work part time. And I went to Limestone and they were so kind to hire me. And, um, you know, uh, after two years, I just couldn't do it anymore. And um, I felt like I was shortchanging the students. And uh, the best thing for me was to uh, step away. And what's so nice is that I have such good friends um, that have Parkinson's disease and those that don't that were just really honest and said, you know, you need to really stay home. You need to take care of yourself. You and Marianne need to enjoy retirement together. You take care of each other. You need to move on. So well, that's what I did. Uh, but like I said, in stage three, you start seeing some cognitive impairment, some cognitive delay, uh, which is an impairment. But a delay is a specific type of cognition uh, disorder. You also see some changes in speech affiliation with cognitive thought, putting the words together with thought. Um, Teresa, a behavior on the cognition and the speech tie-in is often um, somebody in stage three or four uh, loses their filter as far as interrupting people. They're not being rude, it's just, this thing's in my brain and I gotta get it out or I'm gonna lose it. Um, as you know, that happens with Alzheimer's and as you know, Teresa, when we had some athletes with concussions uh, that returned to school, um, that's right too, and they can't think of the words, but when they returned to school, we saw some cognitive delay. And um, because of the plans that you had in place and the measures that we have going for the medical side, uh, they did really well. Uh, stage five uh, is the most advanced and debilitating. So what you're looking at with a, uh, a stage five is somebody that cannot take care of themselves without uh, assistance, that they have ability communicating, uh, the, the disability with communication skills, because they can't remember the words and they can't get them out at the same time. Um, they lose their emotional filter, um, much like um, uh, Alzheimer's patients do lose their emotional filter. Um, they lose their social uh, filter as well. There's a lot of depression involved. Um, they require around-the-clock nursing care because of safety and illness. Um, the person becomes completely dependent on other individuals for their life care. And of course, this is the stage where uh, in stage five, um, Parkinson's patients pass on. But I wanna clarify this, is that folks with Parkinson's disease do not pass on because of Parkinson's disease. They pass on because of the multi-system atrophy and the multi-system compromise caused by Parkinson's disease, okay? When, when the body becomes stiff and when the body is rigid and there's a slowness of movement and the person becomes socially isolated, uh, as we know, 
agitation, aggravation, depression, and anxiety all go together. And then that person sees that what they're losing every day, and they see that life is, is not have hardly any enjoyable times. That's family level four. Uh, cognition is definitely delayed and dysfunctional. Um, and um, dementia, sometimes Louis body, Louis body dementia has already showed up. Um, if it does, but there is dementia in stage four, Parkinson's related dementia. Um, at this time also, there's usually psychosis and sometimes tardive dyskinesia, which is caused by the medications, uh, hallucinations uh, in stage four, and this just progressively becomes worse in stage five. Uh, so those are the five stages of Parkinson's disease. I know I've talked nonstop on that and haven't taken a breath, but then I've tried to answer some questions that were provided, but those are the five stages. Um, uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit more about the rating scales and of course I'm taking direct information here. <clears throat> Your doctor, uh, you know, there's a couple different grading scales that they use and I mentioned the home year stages um, last week in fact um, associated with Parkinson's movement disorders and uh, what it does is it rated the symptoms in one through five, which gave us the stages. And that is the most prominent one. And then there's the Unified Parkinson's Disease Scale, or the UPDRS, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. And what it does is it takes in the non-motor stuff, uh, such as mental functioning, mood, and social interaction. It uh, accounts for the cognitive difficulties and how they affect the ability to carry on um, the activities of daily living and uh, the treatment for complications. So if you have um, a battery of tests that uh, include the unified scale and the uh, home year scale and the Canadian assessment groups, what that will provide along with the Mon Montreal scale as well that I mentioned, have mentioned many times, then what happens is that you have a, such a pinpoint right on diagnoses at the margin of error for not mistreatment, but uh, treatment that doesn't help resolve some of your signs and symptoms, that, that gets narrowed down and there's a small margin of error. Um, and then last week we talked about the DAT scan uh, and also, you know, MRIs are also included in this. Um, uh, with contrast and without contrast, plain view x-rays, uh, the same way. So um, those are the things that, that uh, are associated with the assessment scale. And then what I want to do is talk about Brake's hypothesis. And um, what it says is that... Um, Brake's contention is, is that the early signs of Parkinson's disease um, essentially um, are started in the gut. Um, that the enteric system, which is the GI system, the GI tract is affected. And then it's found is that system is affected the medulla oblongata, the medulla area, which is our breathing, heart rate, respiration, uh, digestion, swallowing, all those areas uh, become affected. And then olfactory, you know, which is we lose the sense of smell. Um, then what that theory says is that, that Parkinson's uh, only progresses uh, into, the, uh, into the cortex and the substantia naglia, which is where we have our dopamine uh, neurons. And that's where the brain death of the neurons occurs. So, um, the true contention that under Brake's hypothesis uh, is this, is that the disorder starts out in the gut. So constipation is one of the things that we would find in that patient reported outcome measure. Also with the digestive tract would be GERD, um, you know, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. Often that has been misdiagnosed, but it, uh, the diagnosis occurred, but really it's a precursor to Parkinson's. 
of irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, often is, is uh, a tossed diagnosis, um, an undefined irritable bowel syndrome. Um, gastroparesis is also tossed out, but as you can see, all these are gastric disorders that are often diagnosed, but uh, subliminally, it's a measure of Parkinson's. So I want to uh, throw out Bracks hypothesis. You have a family member that's in the process of um, diagnostic study for Parkinson's or any other movement disorder. Um, talk to your, your um, physician about Bracks hypothesis and see where they are uh, in that. Um, uh, you're welcome, Becky. I, I hope it helped out. And um, um, hang tough. And, and, you know, you're going to be just fine, girl. We pray for you every day. And uh, you're the catalyst that put our group together. So uh, thank you again for that. And you're awfully kind. Craig Colbert, uh, Army buddy of mine, Parkinson's, combat-related injuries. Uh, Craig and I talked several times during the week. Uh, thanks for being on, brother. Appreciate you. Okay, to move on, let me take a breath here. I've gone nonstop for 36 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about how Parkinson's disease affects men and women differently. And um, I, I read uh, several studies. Um, one by the NIH and um, one that was in Science Daily. The one from NIH was uh, Gender Differences in uh, Parkinson's Disease of Clinical Characteristics and Cognition. And then the other ones by Science Daily. How and why does Parkinson's disease affect women and men differently? And both of those um, are... Um, how would I say, multiple patient studies. The minimum number of folks that were studied were 95, and the maximum was 134. In addition to that, um, the authors of these studies were many. They were not single author studies, and they brought in not only psycho, uh, neuropsychological, but neurological movement disorder specialist, psychiatrist, and uh, NDD, NDT, neurologically deficit trained physician's assistants, nurse practitioners. So they got a lot, wide realm of folks uh, uh, to study these candidates in this study. Uh, either study did not have control groups, which diminishes the quality of study but I want to stick up for these studies because they had a wide cast, uh, um, a, a wide span of folks that were involved in this study. And this study went from 18 years old, yes, 18 for Parkinson's, 18 years old to 64. So that is a huge age, age span. Um, biologically identified males, biologically identified females. Um, for my folks out there that, that, that um, have transgender uh, interests and other um, um, gender designations, I'm sorry, but I stick with the A and the B of, of, of biology that you are a male or a female and the B is because of the biology. So let's move on. And what most studies determined was that females are affected notably different by Parkinson's disease. Here's a simple one that women on the average that of these two groups that were studied um, were developed signs and symptoms of Parkinson's anywhere from one and a half to 2.1 years later than men. The construct of that thought and that proven uh, premise, hypothesis in the studies, clearly 
pinpointed estrogen and that since estrogen moves throughout the body and that estrogen moves throughout the brain that estrogen does provide some level of protection uh, in males and females against Parkinson's disease. Hey Shelly, how you doing? My cousin Shelly's on tonight. I uh, hope Big Pre's with you. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm looking fit. Okay, I'm getting ready for the big uh, uh, Pajaco Primo's bowling match next year, so I've already started my training. That's an inside joke, by the way. But anyway, estrogen, because it's more prominent in females and has wider applications in females than it does in males, the research clearly indicates in all of the studies that I've read in combination studies that estrogen provides a level of protection against not only Parkinson's disease, but movement disorders as a whole. Okay, so number one, estrogen provides a protective barrier in males and females, but because there's more applications of estrogen in women, there's higher levels, um, higher, higher levels of production, higher levels of storage, higher levels of dispensation as far as use, um, that they have a delay time on developing Parkinson's disease. So I think that's, that's uh, uh, very positive. Of course, you know me, if I'm going to give you a positive, I'm going to give you a negative. But I just call it a reality thing. And here's reality. The risk of PD is twice as high in men than women. Okay, guys? But women experience a more rapid disease progression and a lower survival rate. Now, let's stop for a second. I got to say this again. You do not die from Parkinson's. You die with it. You do not die from it. Okay, I can't hit the table enough. You die with it. What happens to folks with Parkinson's because of the multi-system involvement, the degenerative effects in the brain, the neurogenetic uh, neuro deterioration of the chemistry of the brain, that's what causes our bodies to deteriorate, and that's what causes our bodies to fail. But Parkinson's itself is not the responsible factor alone in the loss of somebody that has Parkinson's. Okay, I've stressed that enough. All right. Recent research finds and suggests that biological sex also impacts on disease risk factors, potential on the molecular mechanisms involved in Parkinson's disease and the pathogenesis, which means the progression. Okay. So we're going to find out some positive things out of this studies, these studies. And we're going to also find some things that don't seem so positive. But you know something? If you understand it, if you know what can happen, then dealing with it is big time much better. Okay? And I'm using some of my Shelby-isms, Shelby, North Carolina-isms. Dealing with it makes it more better. Okay? Accepting what's going on is and giving up. Accepting it is understanding and then developing a battle plan. All right? All right. The research also showed, and this comes from my notes, that women and men have distinctive motor and non-motor symptoms as their PD progresses. Motor symptoms later in females. Okay? Oh, am I back on? Did y'all get me? Lost me for a second. We back on. Okay. Motor system symptoms are usually delayed in women. Progressive protection 
receptor of estrogen in combination of progesterone. Whereas men don't have the high level of, um, of progesterone and estrogen in their body as females do. So the motor systems uh, emerge earlier. The most common sign of motor issues in women is the tremor, okay? Whereas men, they usually have tremor and bradykinesia usually pair up. In women, they have the tremor, but bradykinesia comes later. At the same time, women have a tendency to have less falls than men do uh, in the early stages of Parkinson's disease. But as their disease process progresses, they eventually catch up with men, okay? Women have a tendency also to stage at a slower rate than men. Especially women that have a husband or a, a partner in their life, a life mate, they have a tendency to even live longer in a more fruitful Parkinson's life than men do that have a female caregiver, a female partner or a, a, a wife or a partner or a life mate, okay? I think I've made myself clear. Women live longer on the spectrum if they have somebody in their life uh, on a daily basis. They live longer than men and it's because estrogen production, progesterone, socialization, interaction, um, the fight with depression, those kind of things. All righty. However, um, Women have a tendency to experience more pain syndromes than men do. Um, usually this pain is more uh, prevalent in the hips and low back where men have pain in their neck and their shoulders. Now, oddly enough, as time goes on, um, the pain syndromes that women have that usually isolates to the hips and low back move north up into the spine in the thoracic cavity and a man has a tendency to move into the neck and move down in the thoracic cavity so they move both ways to where in the, in the female they move uh, north and usually isolate to the thoracic capability. Um, women have more postural disorder problems because of the difference in the musculature of the individual. Women have less um, mesomorphic build uh, than men. Their women are more ectomorphic, excuse me, endomorphic, have higher levels of adipose and less muscle mass. So they are more osteoporotic at the same time. Listen to all those vocabulary words. And therefore the, the um, decrease in estrogen and progesterone contribute to the osteoarthritis issues which contribute to the postural difficulties. Um, let's talk about the, uh, the non-motors, right? Uh, they're more common in women than men. They usually uh, lose their smell first, then taste. It's rarely together. Oddly enough, uh, they kind of pair up. Women usually, usually lose a sense of smell first, and then the taste moves on. And then, but men usually have that together within most of each other. The authors also said that um, um, cognitive abilities, okay? It said that male patients have worse general cognitive decline in abilities than females. Now, <laughs> I mentioned this uh, to a loved one of mine, and they said, well, you know the reason for that, Jim, is that women are smarter than men. And um, I, I just, you know, safety first, get my mouth shut. And uh, the chemistry of the brain in women develops earlier. The chemistry in the critical thinking ability of the brain develops earlier in the female than it does the male. The, tr the true critical thinking skills uh, in women um, 
lasts longer than does males, and they have <coughs> women have uh, less of a chance of cerebral atrophy um, as men do. <coughs> and the study also brought out that some of the cerebral atrophy and some of the uh, loss of cognition can have a secondary relationship to uh, concussion histories related to sport in both populations. Um, so um, that in itself is another topic of uh, discussion. And the final thing I want to say um, is that um, most uh, women that are post um, that have Parkinson's are most post menopausal. Uh, the question was asked um, if a lady, if a female was diagnosed with Parkinson's in the 30s and early 40s, does that preempt and, and contribute to early premenopause? I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't research that. Um, I, I, I'll be happy to research that if you want me to. But I think that's something that maybe... Um, is tied into the estrogen loss, or can contribute to the estrogen loss, is the is the dopamine uh, malfunction of neurons, and then putting the stress on the estrogen and progesterone and testosterone to maintain the hormonal balance. Maybe it can cause uh, an issue with the disease protection and the predisposition to early uh, premenopause. The last thing that I want to bring on, uh, on as far as the disparities. Um, that um, women that are diagnosed or in the early diagnostic stages me, compared to men usually do not exhibit any signs of dystonia until they're in uh, mid-stage three. And where men will have a tendency to um, this, um, demonstrate dystonia in late stage two, early stage three. So almost as much as a stage or a half a stage, women start demonstrating dystonia. And that's actually the less of a percentage, almost by half. So that's another uh, positive compared to um, a men is that dystonia usually um, is later in, in, in a the Parkinson's progression for women than it is in men. Alrighty, here's what the research said in conclusion. Multi-stage assessment, multi, multi, uh, uh, how would I say, multi-faceted assessment, meaning different types of tests, multiple patient reported outcome measures through each stage of testing, constant testing, evaluation, and assessment during the stage progressions, full body chemistries taken at least two to three times a year until uh, a, a, a true diagnosis is established and they're up to twice a year. DAT scans, <laughs> That scans immediately if Parkinson's is suspected. Um, diagnostic colonoscopy, diagnostic EGD, going down your throat into your belly to take a look at it. As these should be the standardized tests that all Parkinson's, potential Parkinson's patients are uh, go through, should go through. The neuropsychological testing should be done almost immediately if there is suspected Parkinson's or any movement disorder. Therefore, you have the neuropsychological, you have the MRIs, you have the DAT scans, you have the gastro studies, you also have all the blood chemistries, and once you tie all that together, you can sit down and come back with a comprehensive diagnosis of what is going on Therefore, you can have a complex diagnosis and medication-specific therapies and physical therapies, OTs, occupational therapies, speech therapies. I forgot to have a modified brain swallow. Even if you haven't had um, uh, any swallow issues, excuse me. 
excuse me, because you may have a slightly adducted, which means collapsed trachea, uh, in a voice box rather, and not even realize it. That's why you have soft voice. So all those together, okay, it'll probably take you uh, six months to get all of that done. It'll cost you insurance companies your upwards of $100,000. Most of those tests will be turned down the first couple of times, but stay after them and they'll eventually relent. Um, personal suggestion, if your physician suggests a test and the insurance company um, uh, denies it and says their panel of physicians um, does not agree with what the physician says, find out how many of them are neurologists or whatever, and then find every single article you can find that supports your argument for the test and send it to the insurance company and send it by certified letter, send it to the person you talk to, and at the same time have them sign for it. I assure you from personal experience, things will change. Alrighty, that concludes it for tonight. Thanks everybody for watching Don Graham. Uh, happy anniversary, Charlotte Norman. Love to you and Di Wee. Um, folks, when you say your prayers, not remember all of our healthcare workers that still fight the COVID. Um, pray that our politicians um, use good common sense and not political sense and um, develop a plan to get America work back to work again. Um, ask your congressmen and your senators and butts back in Washington and get to work for us, because that's who they work for. Remember our troops abroad and serving on friendly soil, keeping us safe, law enforcement, EMS and fire. The first responders, let's pray for them.